Uh, thanks, James, for inviting me. Um, just, I was thinking, how did I get to uh, get in my position in Team Sky with a little bit of liberty? I'll take you back to when I was eight years old. Um, either my parents didn't like me or I'd done something very wrong, but they sent me to boarding school. <laughs> and um, I shared a dormitory there for 10 years with eight friends who are still all alive, still all in the UK. We all played rugby together at school all the way through to 18. And we still meet up twice a year. And about 20 years ago, we met up in London for the school dinners. And I sat next to my rugby master, <clears throat> who was still at school. And he said, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm just going to practice. I've stopped playing rugby. He said, well, actually, I'm the chairman of the England under-16 rugby team. And um, would you like a job? And uh, for me, that was just the start. And I'd never really planned sort of a career in school of medicine, as it were. Um, I went through rugby, football, um, blind, being a blind team for Argentina. And then, thankfully, and, and um, I've ended up now with what I feel is perfect job uh, within a high performance team with some great colleagues. Um, I've been there for four years now. Um, quickly, I can't leave the, the sort of topic of Team Sky just there. As James knows, I was quite anxious about coming with all the the press stuff at the moment, just to say two things about that. One, the person involved at the time in 2011, there's no suggestion that anybody did anything wrong or illegal. Um, and at the moment, the team, we're under strict instructions not to talk about those instances or those people. So we just have to leave that as it is. And thank you to James, who knew that I was anxious. And um, he rang me last week and he said, look, mate, shit happens in this place. It does, and any of you who have been involved there, I think difficult things happen. And he said, if you can stand up yourself with your own integrity intact, then, you know, go ahead with the talk, and, and that's why I'm here. Um, I think we've got a great story in Team Sky. Uh, we, we don't have unlimited budgets, but we have got a great uh, budget, and I've been lucky enough to do the last two sort of Francis, uh, winning with Chris Froome, which has been such a great experience, as you can imagine. So I'd like to thank some of the staff who put this together for me. Um, so there was a video on the first slide. Let me know if you play. from Norwegian, <coughs> Australian, American, German, Belgian, Belarusian. So we've got an issue about certainly about language to start with and where they live. We've got riders all around the world from Pamplona, Nice, Monaco, Isle of Man, America. Um, so we don't have a base. We don't have a simple uh, camp that we can actually daily or weekly work from. So what's the headline stuff about screening for, for riders? In general practice, you know, I used to sort of try and think of physical, social, and psychological as headlines. 
I think in cycling, what I want to try and get over is that we've got different screening parameters as well. So we've got the physical stuff, we've got the psychological, we're very lucky to work with Steve Peters and the Chip Paradox. Um, we've got mechanical, so we've got bikes, we've got clothing, helmets, glasses, um, and then the environment that they travel in. We've got high risk of infection, um, all the riders in buses, hotels, living together for four weeks on a, a grand tour with the staff, where we can have up to 30, 40 staff on some of the big races. Social, where they live, where they're trained, as I said, from anywhere in France, Italy, um, Monaco, England. They've got families, they've got children. They probably race about 80 to 100 days a year. So the rest of the time, they're with families. Uh, but we, we're not there. And then, obviously, nutritional. We've got the race programme, uh, where they've got high nutritional input, and then they go back home, where, obviously, they, they try to maintain those um, target weights for them. Um, what about physical screening for the riders? Probably the same. Uh, as a lot of you might do in any of the clubs. Um, what I want to try and show is that we have different avenues, to different places and different times in the year when we can screen them. We have an annual camp, which is just coming up in about two weeks' time in Manchester, where all the riders come in for the end of season screening and new riders come in. They have quarterly bloods done, which is a, a mandatory blood test for the UCI, which is really around the health of the rider, just to check and I'll quickly show you what we do in those. We get opportunistic testing when they're ill, um, or, the, or they go to post-operative uh, areas. And then, of course, we've got all the anti-doping uh, blood passports. And probably with cycling, for any of you uh, who are used to your athlete being tested, I think cycling probably has the highest count, the highest rate of being tested. And certainly on the tour last year, not this year, but Chris through has 64 individually different tests over a four-week period. So that would be urine, blood, biological passports, growth hormone. Um, so it's quite intense. Um, so what's the headline stuff around the medicals with the new riders? It's, it's probably typical with football as well. Do it ASAP. We only get a week's notice sometime of a new rider signing. Um, language is a barrier. So we've got one doctor who speaks fluent Spanish. Sorry, two actually. One, one's um, living in Mallorca. And one English doctor who speaks fluent Spanish. We do physical imaging, as you would expect. But they get, all the new riders get a sort of psychological profiling done with Steve Peters. An attitude to doping, or anti-doping as it were. Um, and they get screened on, they have to give access to their Adams passport to look back at all their biological um, passport results in, in the past. In the camp in two weeks' time, <clears throat> again, you'd probably expect a lot of this with, with normal um, clubs. So they get cardiac screening, respiratory, dental. Um, probably the <clears throat> different ones in here uh, is around the bike fit. And obviously our physiotherapists look at the injury profiling. Um, they're trained within uh, this retool system, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, Coming back, cardiac. Normal, we do normal history, um, as per the sort of cry questionnaire. They get an echo and they get an exercise ECG alternate years. And we've had one case of long QT in the last four years. <clears throat> Something very specific to cycling, which I just, again, I think this is one of the beauties of what we do differently and what is special to cycling is cyclists can get external iliac artery stenosis. It's a, an unusual, it's a rare problem. Um, it uh, presents in, in a very obscure manner. They just say their leg doesn't feel right. Um, it can feel numb. It's not like claudication you might find in primary care. Uh, they can get swelling. It can be very, very gradual over 18 months. It's not a sudden change. And um, we've had one case in, in five years. It's, it's, it's unilateral. Um, they think that they get it because it's, it's with hip flexion, firstly. And they're doing normally over 15,000 kilometres a year. That's the um, specialists have found is quite a common factor. So if they're doing over 15k a year, they're more likely to get it. 
Uh, they think it's the sort of endothelial blood flow um, on the external iliac artery intima, or the fact that it sits on the psoas and it gets kinked in hip flexion. Um, it, it's specific to um, cycling. It's, it, if you examine a cyclist normally, um, as we are now, you would find nothing wrong. They don't have any bruises, they have normal pulses. It's a dynamic test. <clears throat> so 15% of them in hip flexion may have a brewing, uh, but most of the testing is dynamic testing, um, looking at ABPIs, pressures in both ankles, in exercise and looking for about a 20 millimetre drop in mercury. Um, even plain angiography may not pick it up. This was the, this is the actual arter MRI arteriogram of our rider that we had three years ago. It took us four or five months to actually pick up his symptoms and realise that's what he had. The treatment, um, obviously it's a stenotic lesion. Um, you can correct the bike position, but they lose power. The riders aren't very happy with that. Um, so it is a, usually, it's a, a surgical approach. Um, they don't want to put stents in, they open up the artery and put a venous patch on, and then they're off the bike for six weeks. There was a case four years ago of a South African rider who thought he'd get back early, didn't stay off the bike six weeks, went back after three, the patch went up, didn't he die? Um, so these guys are on aspirin, off the bike for six weeks. Um, and it's just, it's specific to cycling. Respiratory, we had a good talk yesterday from John Dickinson. Um, and we used John and we used Neil Martin from Leicester to look at our respiratory. And again, very much around the history, looking at the type of formulation of, of um, spray or inhalers they're on. I put spirometry there. We do do the expired nitrous oxide as well, uh, which I forgot to put on there. Uh, looking at exercise-induced asthma. We look with the EVH, which is the gold standard. And the, the riders, as John said, it's a pretty unpleasant test. Um, really only want to do it once. And we found about 45% of our riders have an FEV1 um, of, of a drop of over 10%. So nearly half our squad have got... Um, diagnostic EIB um, and again we mentioned yesterday about the uh, vocal cord dysfunction or the ILO as it's now termed and we've got certainly got a one rider particularly uh, where that's a prominent feature and he spends a lot of time with a speech and language therapist and with um, breathing patterns to great effect so I think this um, pattern as we saw yesterday of having a mixture of dysfunctional breathing, vocal cord dysfunction, um, exercise induced bronchoconstriction, we certainly see with our riders. Dental, again working on from Ian Needleman's work from the Olympics, he came and screened our riders last year, we're getting a dental screening again this year, and looking again just for obvious, you know, caries, um, and education with sports drinks. We're looking at um, hyperfluoridated toothpaste, and there's a, a company who are now uh, promoting this Biomin F, which has got small silica particles in it, which is supposed to uh, keep the fluoride on the tooth longer. So we're going to be trialing that. Uh, medical, when we see them, we go over their history, we look at their medications. Um, try and see if there's any current TUEs with, with any asthma medications generally that need uh, reapplying for. We examine them, vaccinims, and this year, you know, it's four years now, we, we're actually just getting into hepatitis B. We should have been doing it earlier, I feel, but um, with everything else we've got to do, we're screening them this year and, and looking at immunising. They get a bike fit, as I said, with the physios. They're trained with a root tool, this American system which I'll show you here, which is a 3D motion capture system uh, where you put these LED markers onto the body and um, the software then, as you can see here, this was supposed to be a video, I apologise, it hasn't come out as a video, I don't know why. Um, it was going to show him cycling. And what you can see here is the sensor at the front um, looking at the, the eight markers. It measures hip flexion, knee flexion, 
it's got the, the ranges of movement that are um, the best angles, if you like, uh, that the rider should be in for maximum power output. And so they have a bike prefix based on you know, their own comfort, their own injury profiling, um, and looking at maximal power output, which is measured through the cranks in the bike here. Clothing, again, something that's very different perhaps to a football or rugby. They get the kit and they put it on. Um, here we've got riders who've got silicon sensitivities. We have big issues with cyclists with saddle sores. So in the perineal area, uh, with the heat, sweating, um, their perineum gets very sore and can get infected. So looking at hygiene, washing, and making sure that we call the chamois, or the, sh the, the, the padding within the big shorts, fits them perfectly, so there's no seams that rub. So they do get perineal templates taken every year from the kit fitters, um, so that individual shorts are made for individual riders, so the padding uh, fits perfectly for them. Um, and then this year we've introduced, just leading on from that, um, a, a wash truck. So we've got a chef's truck, we've got a bus, and now we've got a washing truck with five washing machines in, so that the kit is washed separately. The shorts are turned inside out to get all the creams and everything off them, um, and they're washed at 60 degrees, the, the kit will allow that, with an antimicrobial wash powder. Um, nutrition, I don't know if James is here, he was here last night, but um, he's talking this afternoon. James Morton, very lucky to be able to work with a really top nutritionist from here in Liverpool. Um, and I was interested to hear Emma Deakins talk yesterday about bone mineral uh, density and turnover. And we do do um, annual DEXA scans, we'd like to do more, but as you can see from, from how we live, and where they live, just getting them all together, even once a year, it, it is a very difficult um, problem for us. We found, sort of headline stuff here really, that 40% of our riders had Z scores, bone mineral density, minus two and minus three. And in that group, um, that group suffered in the last two years 14 fractures, as opposed to the other half of the, the squad who weren't osteoporotic, um, they suffered two. And one of our top riders uh, fractured his molecular bone just simply putting his foot out of the cleat. Um, so it's a real problem, and um, I think as I discussed yesterday, these riders live in, in a permanent negative energy balance, really, with training and racing, and bone is a source of, of energy. Um, they don't do much weight-bearing exercise, and we've thought about how can we try to help protect them and, and change or reverse these changes. But, of course, they can't do... We don't want them doing a lot of weight-bearing exercise. The risk of stress fractures to them would be extremely high. So we're looking at plyometrics... We're looking at vibro plates um, and, and getting some vibro plates possibly onto the bus and for these riders at home. And there is evidence that bone mineral density can be at least stabilised or partially reversed um, using vibro plates. And of course they get supplement reviews. Podiatry, it's not just about shoes and orthotics. Cycling is a biomechanical chain from hip to knee to ankle to foot. So if they change their saddle height and their hip angle changes, their knee angle changes, their position with their cleats on the, on the pedal changes. Um, so the, the, the podiatrist really has to uh, work at the end of that chain with all these other biomechanical um, issues changing. So it, it's not simple and his orthotics can change two or three times in the year depending on their shoes and cleats. Bloods, we do um, celiac screening, virology, um, very important for us uh, with the environment we're in. Infections is 50% of our problems medically. Uh, vision, I think we could do more with dynamic vision, peripheral vision testing, which we don't do at the moment, but I think it's something we should do, particularly with the riders in pelotons and the speed they're going at. Uh, quarterly bloods, again, um, we do all of these, highlighting probably vitamin D, uh, testosterone, the variability of testosterone, uh, which we find. Um, opportunistic infections, monitoring, um, do a lot of work on that at the moment. Prevention, flights, training loads. Uh, biological passport, very quickly, I'm near the end, don't worry, James. 
Um, as I say, we're, we're probably the most tested sport. And for those of you who don't know about the biological passport, it's a very complicated equation here with using the haemoglobin in a reticular site count. And it gives an off score. And it's supposed to show when, when the haematological systems are switched off. And if you look at the right-hand side here, this just shows, shows very quickly um, the two, two red arrows coming down take blood off. So your reticular site count would go up. If you put blood back in, your reticular site count would drop. And the idea then of the off score is this. You get a series of results falling between two parameters for yourself, the confidence limits. And the idea is that it would pick up if you fall outside your, your confidence limits um, and, and suggest something's not right. We give advice to the riders about having been, when they're tested, um, they have to have two hours off exercise. We tell them if they've been ill, massage, anything else to put down on the form. Um, they, they need to be seated. Um, that's, a, that, that's trying to quickly whip through it all in a way um, to show that we, we do do a, a big screen. We do opportunistically pick up and, and monitor a lot of these blood results throughout the year, um, which I'm not sure of some of the significance of some of them. Uh, we, we find huge variabilities in testosterone and even subclinical thyroid, um, hypothyroid issues. Um, what can we do better? We, we can integrate better with ourselves. Training loads um, and medical and coaching data. We have separate systems at the moment, which doesn't work very well. Um, we're looking at infection diagnostics, um, particularly point of contact, CRP. Um, it's our biggest risk area, apart from crashes. Um, remote well-being. It's a nightmare, the riders being all around the world trying to keep an eye on them and understand what they're doing away from races. Um, and possibly you know, heat acclimatisation, again, is something that I think we could do better. But the team will not fly riders in a week early to a hot race. Um, they still come in two or three days, and, and, and we, we could do better with that, I feel. Um, so I've tried to give you a very brief but broad <laughs> synopsis of what we do within, within Team Sky. Um, so thank you very much. I think we're just going to finish. There was just a quick video to finish there. And I'm happy to take any questions afterwards on any non-topical issues.